few months ago, and it seems like a lifetime, we did a video talking about RAMP. RAMP had just been set up, and it was a collaboration between some data scientists and some programmers and some uh, mathematicians and physicists at different universities and commercial organisations to model the pandemic. Rapid assistance in modelling the pandemic and some of its results are now out. So we're going to have a look. Now in the video that we did, the link is below, we suggested that part of RAMP might be modelling schools and what they might do modelling schools. And if I scroll down here, the, the one that caught my eye wasn't modelling schools, it was modelling supermarkets. So we all have to go to the supermarket to buy food. And this is a, a, a super important part of daily life. And therefore, this is a super interesting uh, application of the, the techniques that RAMP are using. So it says that it's Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's are involved. And the paper is called Simulating Human Interactions in Supermarkets to Measure the Risk of COVID-19 Contagion at Scale. And I've got it right here. So let's have a look to see what they did. And I'm going to try and explain it as simply as possible because this is actually really important for people to know about, I think. So first of all, we've got one, two, three, four, five authors and all of them are data scientists or mathematicians and this last one seems to have a connection with Sainsbury's. I think he might be employed by Sainsbury's. So what did they do? Well, there's four main parts listed here. We'll, we'll look through them. And then there's a fifth part which has been relegated to the appendix and that's actually the interesting bit for for us that's the bit that we're going to concentrate on i don't know why they've, they've, they've shoved it out to the end but uh what they did was they looked at modeling the probability distribution of collisions so let's start with that so down here the main goal of the task was to find the probability of x collisions occurring in a time interval of length t in a supermarket now, we do not know yet how in infectious this disease is in detail. The rules in different countries are, are slightly different. I think um, in the United Kingdom, the idea is that if you're inside, you should certainly wear a mask if you're inside a, a shop. And uh, you want to keep two metres away from people. And the risk seems to increase, the, the risk of infection seems to increase when you have been uh, close to someone for 15 minutes or more. Well, of course it does, but the, 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 the um, risk seems to be significant at 15 minutes. And that's what they say here. In other words, it's more probable to get the virus if someone is exposed for four hours rather than five minutes. But the point that we're trying to make is that the authors have to focus on collisions. They can't focus directly on the probability of catching COVID because we don't know what that probability is. So we're using collisions, in other words, two, or I guess more, but, but you, you talk about pairs, two people coming together. And um, if under different scenarios that's reduced, the assumption is and it would seem to be valid, that the uh, risk of catching COVID is also reduced. So we model collisions rather than directly modelling um, the probability of catching the thing. And if we scroll down, we can see yeah, what they did. It's incomprehensible to most people. And it's not something that I would work on myself. And in actual fact, later on, once we get to the appendix, the authors talk about... Um, how this analysis can't cope with most of the situations we would need it to be able to cope with. So I wouldn't b bother doing this in the, in the first place because it would just take too much effort for me. But, and we've talked about this on different videos as well on this channel, it might be that this is the language that uh, these guys speak. So this might be the equivalent of someone writing a short story. So someone writes a short story and it's, um, it's difficult for them to write a short story as it is 
for these guys to write this mathematics. It's just a different language. So no problem with that, but I, we're not going to go through it. Right, what next? Well, now we're getting into how people behave inside a supermarket. And they use existing theory, the theory of chaotic dynamical systems. And the important bit here is chaos. And you know yourself when you go to the supermarket, there is an amount of chaos. You go past the yogurt and you think, oh, I need to go back and get a yogurt. You go, go past the soft drinks and you don't want soft drinks, so you shuffle the kids on quickly past that bit. And then you think, oh, I forgot to get biscuits. And then I go back and there's people there and you go around them and you're mixing in and that is chaos. And the dynamics in a store is trying to capture that sort of behaviour. So you're back and forth, you're left and right, you're going, re retracing your steps, you think you need to rush ahead and get that before I forget, rush ahead and then go back. All of that sort of thing is what they're trying to capture here. Now, that will obviously change in COVID times. So in COVID times, the supermarket has taken steps to space people out and to avoid that sort of chaos. So why are we bothering with this or why are they bothering with this? Well, what we want to do is we want to see, and when I say we, society, that's, that's why they're doing this. Society wants to know if messing about with uh, the way we behave in supermarkets, is it worth it? Does that lead to a, a, a big saving in terms of, of the spread of this disease? And how big a saving are we, uh, are we get, gaining from doing that? And the amount of messing about that we do, the amount of tinkering with human behaviour in, in the supermarket, uh, which bit it gives the best payoff? And to do that, we need to start with current behaviour. So how people behave without any tinkering with human behaviour. And then we uh, tinker with the behaviour and decide... Um, is the difference worth it? So there's X collisions normally. There's Y collisions after we tinker with human behaviour. The difference between X and Y, is it worth the hassle that the tinkering will force on, on society? That's, that's essentially why we need to know the dynamics at the minute. It's difficult to know how else they would do that. So you could set a camera up in a in a Sainsbury store and, uh, and and measure how people move backwards and forwards. But you would have needed that before COVID. So they don't they, they, they don't uh, use any um, real data for that as far as I can see. They're just relying on, on uh, this theory of chaotic dynamical systems. Absolutely fine. Yeah, brilliant. So we scroll on and this next bit is um, looking at how people move around a shop. So in the, the previous section we had back and forth and, and the chaos of, of, of moving along the aisles. Here we want to see where in the shop they're actually trying to get to. Uh, so um, do people go to um, the, the meat bit first? and then the cheeses, and then the cereals, and then the whatevers. And um, it's not just do people do that, but what are, the, um, what are the common trajectories around the store, and where are the hot spots? Because we're going to have in a store people talk, touching things, they're going to be picking up produce, putting it back, and the bits that are touched the most, so the hot spots, are perhaps where the, the spread is most likely. So it's going to be important to, to know about that. So what did they do here? Well, um, they're relying on existing data. So they're trying to fit, this is that expectation maximization. They're trying to fit um, the modeling that they're doing to real data. And the real data is presumably coming from Sainsbury's, although later on they do talk about how they need more of that. So, um, Basically, the, the, uh, what will happen is at the, probably at the till, the order that the items are scanned gives you a rough idea of 
um, how people navigated the store in reverse. So the last things they put into the basket are the first things out. So that would be one example of how you could work backwards from shopping basket data, so till data, to figure out how people move around the this, this store. Um, you could also look at the sort of things that they're buying because if um, the, the most popular items are going to be where the hotspots are. So that's the trajectories. Sample size, so this is this section is talking about uh, some statistics, how many, um, uh, we haven't talked about the simulation yet, but how many simulations do they need to run? How many times do they need to do their analysis uh, before they can become confident that the results are meaningful? So that's what that bit is. So that's some statistics stuff that we won't focus in on. And then we hit the references. So then we hit the end of the paper and we start what I think is the interesting bit. So this is the technical appendix. So up until this point, it's all been analytics. So they're doing a mathematical analysis. But what they then move on to do is an agent-based simulation. And this is what we were talking about in our previous video. An agent-based simulation which can handle all of the situations, it can handle easily all of the situations that their mathematical analysis from the first part cannot. So I've got a list here of the things that they say that they can handle, but it's just super difficult for them to handle. So if I scroll up, where do they say it? Um, uh, the complexity of including these. So if they try to include any of these in their mathematical analysis, the complexity of their sums shoots up. Whereas in an agent-based model, it's actually really, really easy to add these in. So the things are like, customer will return to the store while in a queue. Everybody knows that happens. You get to the, the, the queue for the till. Oh, I forgot a magazine. I run back to get a magazine. That happens all the time, every day. Um, I don't know. You can read these yourselves. Um, customers may get slower as items are added to basket. That's an interesting one. So people walk around a store at a certain speed, but as the thing gets heavier that they're carrying, obviously that speed will slow down. And um, that, all of these things, will have an impact on the collisions that uh, they analysed in the first section of the, the paper. But actually, the analysis that they present there can't handle these, or sorry, doesn't handle these at the minute, and if you want to include them, it becomes extremely complicated. So what they do instead is they set up an agent-based model, and the agent-based model will be able to output all of this, and this, for me, is the page to focus on. So this is where it's at. This is the, the output from their work. And uh, this is the most interesting bit, and in my opinion, the most important bit, which we will get to in a minute. But if we look down here, first of all, it talks here about how they set up their simulation. They use this thing called Unity 3D. And just by coincidence, I mean, I'm super interested in that. And just by coincidence, it's on this page. That's why I'm, I'm saying that this is the most interesting page. So let's go and have a look. So this is the Unity store. This is where you can get hold of that software. And it's super expensive for businesses. But if we go here, it is possible to get a free version if you jump through some hoops about joining GitHub, this, that, and the other. Um, I guess that the authors are familiar with this software and that's why they use it. There's no other, other reason. Why would you bother learning something new? And I'm going to apply exactly the same thing. Why would we bother stepping away from our preferred approach on this channel, which is NetLogo? So let's have a look at what these authors did in Unity, and we're going to use NetLogo to explain it. Uh, so all I did was search for NetLogo Supermarket, and this is the first hit that came up. And actually, I was quite surprised there wasn't that much. There were, there were a few attempts to model supermarkets, but um, uh, there wasn't as much as I would have expected. Now, the problem here is that this model is in Spanish. I have no idea of what this is doing. I'll show you it, but uh, I don't know. Don't understand any of this. 
I actually find it easier to develop my own model than, uh, than try to translate this. So I've got a super simple, this took 20 minutes to do, super simple model just to illustrate. Ah, oh, this mouse, this is what happens when you work at home. I don't have a proper mouse mat and my mouse goes mad. Okay, so all I've done is simulate a very simple supermarket. We're looking down on the supermarket, the red bit that's the entrances and the exits. The blue bits form the aisles and the white bits are where people will walk. And if I click go, it shows you very simply what happens. People come into the store, they walk around, they buy stuff, and then eventually they will walk out. I haven't implemented the walk out. But that is my simulation. That is an agent-based approach to modeling Sainsbury's. And uh, we could easily include more detail. I guess that Sainsbury's do actually have a standard layout depending on the size of the store. So if they've got X square feet, the, the, the shop looks like this. If they've got Y square feet, it'll look like something else. I guess they have, I don't know. But uh, you could take a standard kind of default shape for the, for the, uh, the, the uh, store and then add in all of the things that were in the table here. So you could program your agents very easily so that some will pay by cash and some will pay by card. Some will violate social distancing and some won't. Some will get distracted by certain items and some won't. Some will return to the store while in the queue. You can add that. Uh, it's um, extremely simple to do and uh, it doesn't involve any complicated mathematics at all. Um, all that you're doing is taking um, the information from how people behave in the store from the earlier section in the, in the paper about trajectories. You're adding in behaviour about um, chaos, again, from earlier in the paper. And then you're adding in this. And then what comes out? Well, this is the output. This is the, this is the important bit. So these are the outputs that we can have from the simulation or that, that, that the authors suggest that we should take from the simulation. And we use this to judge whether or not um, uh, different interventions have any impact. So we look to output the number of customers at checkouts at any time, the number of customers in the shop at any time, the number of customers standing around at any time, um, and the number of customers queuing. The time at the checkout, the time spent shopping, all of these things are output in a big spreadsheet. And then we change the model. So we go back to the model and we introduce some social distancing measures. So this is as, as uh, the model runs normally. So on a normal day before COVID, then we introduce certain social distancing measures. What happens when we only let 100 people into the store at once? What happens when we only let 200 people into the store at once? What happens when we only let 50 people into the store at once? And then we compare, we statistically compare the, the, this output from before COVID with these different interventions. What happens when we ask people to space out three metres, two metres, one metre? What difference does it make to all of this output? And then we can start to figure out which interventions are worth doing and which aren't. So there it is, that's RAMP. That's one of their first outputs, simulating human interactions in supermarkets. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic that these guys are given their time to do this and helping society get past this, perfect timing, get past this pandemic.